Good evening. Like my mother, I was born in the great city of Los Angeles, a city fabled for its sunshine and palm trees and automobiles. And like boys growing up in any city anywhere around the world, um, I really liked trains. In fact, kind of all forms of transportation. And I especially liked cars. And I also liked watching a lot of TV. It was in the 1970s. And one of the things that TV taught me was that cars would bring me freedom, autonomy, social status. And later, TV taught me that cars would bring me sex. Um, and so this lecture is about sex and the city 2.0. Our love affair with the automobile started really early here in the United States. In fact, it really started with the General Motors sponsored Futurama exhibits at the 1933, 39, and 64 World's Fairs. Um, in 1933, at the World's Fairs, about a third of the population of the entire United States in the middle of the Great Depression attended the World's Fair. And in each, all three of these fairs, the most visited exhibit was Futurama. In fact, in the 1964 World's Fairs, the Futurama exhibit broke the record for the most visited industrial exhibit, um, exhibit in the history of the world. And General Motors not only tried to sell us General Motors vehicles, but sold us a vision of the city of the future. And this was an incredibly powerful vision. It was a vision of easygoing, free mobility and freedom, really, in all senses of the word, that automobiles would transform our lives for the better. Um, and that cities could be reinvented in order to accommodate this easygoing motordom. Um, and that not only would we have a chicken in every pot, but a General Motors car in every garage. And so this vision that, that we were given, uh, all of us as Americans, um, informed our thinking and our popular culture in a million different ways. In fact, if you were to ask a child even today to draw a picture of the city of the future, she is very, very likely to draw an image that comes directly from the 1933 World's Fair or the 1962 Hanna-Barbera cartoon, <laughs> The Jetsons, which is in fact inspired directly from the, the, um, each of those Futurama exhibits at the World's Fair. This was an incredibly powerful vision of the city of the future, a city that was free, that allowed us to do anything, be anyone, become anything, become rich, fall in love, achieve our wildest dreams. And so is it any wonder that all of us is a little bit pissed off when the, this vision of the future is not quite what we were promised, particularly when even the diabolical geniuses um, at Disneyland, uh, where the 1955 Autopia ride remains one of the most popular rides at Disneyland to this day, even at Disneyland, they can't come up with a better vision of the city of the future than their 1955, now kind of kitschy, yesterday land. Um, and so this creates a sort of promise, a problem for all of us, where, you know, all of us are so happy, you know, driving in our little, uh, uh, you know, Chevron-sponsored automobiles in the Utopia ride, and yet we wonder why, when it's so happy in the picture on TV or at Disneyland, that the promise does not turn out to be quite like reality. It's very, very disappointing. It makes us upset. Part of our challenge is not only to come up with a new vision for how our cities work and how transportation is a part of that vision, but really to think about how we uh, plan for our cities in all possible ways. When I work all over the United States, Every city that I go to has these very, very flowery policy statements that call for, you know, no traffic congestion and ample parking and, uh, you know, walkability and rainbows and sunshine. And yet what we find is that when we look into the DNA, into the rules and regulations and guidelines and codes of those cities, that the only thing that developers can actually legally build is automobile-dependent sprawl. And even when we go to design streets, one of the things that we find 
is not that engineers are actually evil people. They're actually doing what is required of them in the rules and regulations and guidance. This street could be really anywhere in the United States, and I really ask you to think about if, there, if you've ever come across a street designed in the last 50 years that is a place that you actually want to be. Well, the reason it's not is because it's illegal for it to be that. So in this street, you'll notice there's a mix of uses. There's some shopping, there's some housing, there's some workplaces, there's plenty of free parking, there's no traffic congestion, there's even some landscape and some sidewalks. This is walkable, mixed-use uh, development, exactly like the policy guidance said. And, and look, there's even a, a pedestrian there in the middle. And so we wonder um, why there is this gap between what we are promised in policy guidance and what the rules and regulations of our communities actually force architects and traffic engineers to build. <laughs> Part of the underlying problem is the over-specialization of our industries and the fact that there are so many different professionals that are asked to look at one specific aspect of city building and optimize just that one resource, like traffic congestion. Make the traffic move smoothly. Who cares about the consequences? Another part of the problem is that modernism overestimates what we humans are capable of. Now, human beings are perhaps the most adaptable species on the planet, but neuroscience and the mental health professions and the public health professions are teaching us increasingly in the last decade that our brains are hardwired in very specific ways, and there are rather narrow uh, habitat types that optimize our human happiness. And in neuroscience, one of the most fascinating topics that I've been exploring in the last couple of years is around this fascinating little neuropeptide that is produced by the pituitary gland in the brain called oxytocin. Now, oxytocin is effectively the biological basis of trust. It's, it's the chemical in our brain that allows for mutual reciprocity. It's the I'll, I'll scratch your back, you scratch my back drug. And in fact, there's a great article just in this month's journal, Nature, in which uh, Dr. Gul Doran uh, describes how oxytocin provides for the basis of long-term loving relationships, in fact, monogamy. If you take it away, uh, the oxytocin re receptors from voles, uh, not only do they get promiscuous, but they get unhappy. So oxytocin is produced under very specific circumstances. Uh, our brain releases it when we, when we gaze longingly into the eyes of our beloved. It is released most prominently during <laughs> orgasm and breastfeeding for obvious reasons uh, that have uh, nothing to do with our larger topic tonight, which is really about another way in which oxytocin is produced, which is simple outdoor exercise. Um, and we all find this. No matter how bad the argument is that you're having with your significant other, when you go outside, go for a walk, go for a run, go for a bike ride, We've all experienced that feeling of, oh, everything is actually going to be okay, even though it didn't just 15 minutes before. That's your brain chemistry at work. And in addition to dopamine and some other chemicals, one of the prominent chemicals, particularly in your relationships with your loved ones, is oxytocin um, at play. On the other hand, there's another center of the brain called the amygdala. And these are the most primitive part of the brain. The amygdala are responsible for the fight or flight response. Now, in our normal lives, we humans are incredibly well adapted to receive a lot of social signals from each other, uh, even without verbal communication. So, you know, we can, uh, as kids, navigate a junior high school sleepover party, perhaps one of the most treacherous things that any, any of us have ever done. We can walk down a crowded street in Manhattan and not run into anyone, even though we don't have you know, blinkers on our belt. And if we do happen to brush into somebody, you don't have to stop and apologize and say, oh, I am terribly sorry, sir, for bumping in into you. All you have to do is you know, shrug your shoulders a little bit, tilt your head, um, and that says, that was inadvertent, I am sorry. Uh, you get a kind of, you know, uh, in response, and all is good. You go about your day, and you don't even think about it. In the carapace of our automobiles, cut off from these social signals. The power of the brain to process social information is shut down. And so when I'm driving in my car, and this guy cuts me off, you know, what the heck? You know, this is clearly a threat. 
to, to my, to, well, my, my safety, or at the very least my social status. He has just dissed me, right? And I'm pissed, and now I'm yelling at him, and he's not even responding, right? So this escalates the problem. Of course, the poor guy in front of me wasn't even aware that I was there, and, or maybe he's saying, oh, I'm terribly sorry, but, you know, at 65 miles an hour, and in these skins of glass and steel, our brains can't receive that information, and so the amygdala fire. And what happens? Well, our muscles tense, we get, we get you know, strong. Uh, the prefrontal cortex of the brain shuts down. Now, in a fight or flight response, when you're being chased down by a saber-toothed tiger, you don't have time to waste to think about the consequences of your actions. That's what the prefrontal cortex is for. That shuts down, you react instinctively. And so, for all of you in the room who've driven a car, you perhaps have noticed that you have done things or said things behind the wheel that you would never do in your regular life. This is the amygdala firing. And when the amygdala fires consistently every day, if your daily life requires you being stuck in traffic congestion in order to get to work, this creates permanent changes to your brain that make you more angry, less trustful, more reactive, less able to think through the consequences of your actions. In fact, Nate Silver, the uh, great statistician formerly of the New York Times, now of ESPN, uh, rather famously tweeted, or tweeted a heuristic uh, that uh, places with sidewalks vote Democratic, those without vote Republican. I don't know what he meant by that, but I'll leave that for you to all figure out. And so, we also notice that when walking is taken out of our daily lives and we have to be stuck in cars to take care of everything, or we're expected to drive to go to the gym and you know, walk on a treadmill, who wants to do that? That there is a strong correlation between rates of driving and rates of obesity and with rates of obesity and all of the things that come with that, including diabetes and cardiovascular fitness and a whole host of other um, very unpleasant and cost costly um, health issues. And so we wonder why, when we know that having walking be a delightful part of everyday life makes us happier and sexier and more fit and more loving, and too much driving makes us unhappy and mistrustful and die early, that every single one of the transportation performance metrics, every measure of the success of your transportation system, pays attention to that rather than that or that or that. This is a conversation about transportation performance metrics, and uh, it's rather wonkish. And one of the things that I think it's important to understand is where the data comes from as we make transportation decisions. Much of the transportation world uh, sort of came together in the late 1950s and 1960s, and it's based upon data that was collected mostly in Florida in the 1960s and 1970s, when rates of driving across the United States were increasing at a regular rate, we assumed that people wanted to drive, and it was our job to accommodate that. Part of the problem, though, is that when we uh, look at how we measure success uh, in our transportation systems in the United States, we focus on a single measure. That measure is called Level of Service, or LOS, and many of you have probably heard of this. Um, LOS is a letter grade system that measures how congested a road is. So level service A will say that the road is basically empty in the peak one hour, uh, or in some cases, peak 15 minutes. And level service F, there are as many cars on that street as the street can handle, and it is congested, and you can't fit any more cars in the street. Part of the problem with this system is that many people mistake the letter grade system with their elementary school report cards. How many of you want your kid to get an F in class? Probably none of you. F is bad, A is really good. And so many citizens, and especially traffic engineers, think that an A is the perfect street, and an F is not only a bad street, but it, it, it is the result of a personal failure on the part of the traffic engineer. However, if we change perspectives, and if we look at this street from the perspective of an economist, say, Level service F in the peak one hour means that that capital resource is being fully utilized. It was designed to exactly the right size. And of course, there should be some congestion in the peak one hour. It will be working fine every other hour. Um, and in fact, 
if you are a retailer, level of service F is a lot better than level of service A. You want people to be driving past your store and to be driving slow enough to be able to see in your storefront window. In many cases, level of service E, even from a systems perspective, is about perfect. It's also important to understand what happens when we try to solve a level of service F problem. We have limited tools at our, disposable, at our disposal in order to be able to do that. We can either, if our model projects that traffic is gonna be a level of service F, we can either widen the road or we can move the development somewhere else, somewhere where there's not currently some traffic congestion and cross our fingers and hope that that traffic then doesn't flow back to where we are. Fortunately, our models don't really look that far, so usually that's a pretty safe bet. So the problem is, however, that while traffic congestion makes us unhappy, and when we're unhappy, we demand that our traffic engineers widen roadways. So, you know, they'll spend a bunch of money and they'll do that. And that's great. So now we can drive faster, and that makes us happy. It also allows us then to, you know, uh, go to that new restaurant across town that we would have never gone to because you'd have to drive through the congested road in order to get there. Now it's okay, now I could drive across town to get to that restaurant. Or now I can move my family to a bigger house farther away that's cheaper because I can still drive to work twice the distance because we've eliminated the congestion problem. So when we have faster driving, the result of that is of course more driving. And more driving leads us to more congestion and then more congestion makes us widen the roadway. And we notice that as we keep widening the roadway, it makes it impossible for pedestrians to get across the street, for bicyclists to feel safe, or for transit even to work, because you can't actually get to the bus stop. An over-reliance on level of service means that the cure for congestion is in fact causing the disease. So, what do we do? Well, the first thing that we need to do is to recognize that things are changing, and particularly market preferences are changing. As I said before, we assumed long ago that people want to drive, and they're gonna to want to drive in increasingly greater numbers. However, in the United States, lagging behind a little bit other countries around the world, we've seen a sharp drop-off in rates of driving. And there are several causes of this. One, of course, was the recession, although the numbers have continued to drop despite the recovery. The larger issue, and one that has the automobile manufacturers in a complete panic, is a change in attitudes. My generation was the last generation that actually believed the television commercials when they told us that owning and driving a car would bring us freedom, autonomy, social status, power, and sex. Today, particularly for kids these days, there's one thing that gets them those things, and it's not a car, it's this, right? In fact, Driving in a car prevents me from being able to use the very device that gets me everything that I want. And so we're finding this radical change in attitude that an automobile is just one of many mobility tools. It is not an extension of self-identity anymore. And if that's not true, then how can advertisers market it to us? Another thing that is changing is many cities are recognizing this problem of transportation performance metrics, that okay, people care about congestion, but it's the job of the transportation system to reflect all local community values, not just eliminating congestion. The transportation system needs to support the local economy, it needs to support social equity, it needs to support residential quality of life, uh, ecological sustainability, all sorts of other goals. And if those goals are not reflected in how we measure transportation success, they're going to be ignored. Just outside of town, there's a giant water tank that's very, very high, and in letters probably 20 feet high, it proudly proclaims Sacramento as city of trees. And yet when I go to this city's very roadway design guidelines, trees are assumed to be fixed hazardous objects. <laughs> in the transportation DNA of Sacramento, trees are a problem, even though we know in this very city the degree to which trees dramatically enhance property values, reduce temperatures, and increase human happiness. Why are trees not a transportation performance metric here or really in any city in America? And, okay, trees are all well and good, but how about people? 
Many cities around the United States, um, recently New York of all places, most prominently, um, have been collecting data about changes to their street networks, such as eliminating traffic lanes in order to widen the sidewalk and make the sidewalk better, um, and then collecting after data on the results. And lo and behold, even by eliminating uh, traffic lanes, they've not really increased congestion, but they have significantly improved retail performance along stores on that street and human happiness. Why is retail performance not the primary transportation performance metric of a main street? And why is human happiness ignored completely? And indeed, why do we assume that we need to accommodate every single trip, every single human need, as a vehicle trip? Why don't we have standards that allow or require land uses to be mixed? 80% of our trips are not trips to work. They are rather errand running, taking our kids to school, going and meeting friends, going out to dinner, you know, picking up laundry. If all of those trips were within walking distance of our homes, or even within walking distance of our office, or even a few of those trips were within walking distance, we could dramatically reduce our automobile dependency. And yet for cities that make it illegal to mix land uses, and most cities do this, this is re effectively requiring citizens to make an automobile trip for every trip. And, we, and yet, we complain about traffic congestion problems. Why don't we measure the usefulness of our cities for bicyclists? And it, rather than simply assuming that the bicyclists in our city are, you know, 25-year-old lycra-clad men, why don't we design our cities for women or for children to feel safe and comfortable biking on every street in our cities. Bike is the most amazingly energy efficient form of transportation that has ever been invented. Um, in fact, it in many ways is, uh, uh, I think, a primary component of the future of all great cities. Bikes are oftentimes ignored or uh, are not accommodated uh, because of fears of cyclist safety. And yet, in every city in the United States, Davis, San Francisco, New York, Portland, that have measured uh, the effect of implementing high-quality bike facilities, what they find is a big increase in the number of cyclists and a concomitant decrease in the crash rate for those cyclists. Nothing makes cyclists or pedestrians safer than more cyclists and pedestrians. Um, and indeed, uh, measurements from New York and Seattle have shown that eliminating traffic lanes or even parking lanes on retail streets improve retail performance, in part because cyclists shop more often, shop locally, and don't have to drive around the block three times trying to find a parking space. We also find uh, in other cities, I think more prominently in France, uh, in cities like Strasbourg or Lyon or Marseille, that when you design transit, to not only be fast and frequent and reliable, but to allow it to be dignified, or more importantly, like in this tram, notice the clear floor-to-ceiling glass. This tram makes riding in it. Uh, it allows you to partake in the full pageantry of the city. It's not just a way of getting from A to B, it's a way of promenading. In fact, what it allows is for really that most important factor of urban success to succeed, and that factor is flirtation. In fact, I would argue that really the fundamental basis of economic success for great cities of the 21st century is going to be flirtation, not actually sex. In fact, the way the brain is hardwired, um, so much of our social well-being is supported, not by sex, but by flirtation. But that, of course, is an entirely different lecture. <laughs> So, what I urge you all to do and to think about is the ways in which you love your city and the ways in which you want to see your values reflected in the way your city manages itself. Here in a democracy, we've got, in fact, a duty to make sure that what is important to us is also important to our government, and that our government respond in ways that embrace and enhance our local values. Um, it is important to remember that these metrics of success, these design codes, this DNA of the city, your city's traffic engineers are not in charge of those rules and regulations. You are, or at least your elected officials are. So I urge you to understand this wonkishness 
um, this science, this DNA, and to make sure that the rules and regulations of your city, in fact, enhance your values. And I will leave you uh, with one final point. If your values include sustainability, another thing that I find fascinating about neuroscience is the way in which beauty is hardwired into our brains. We crave beauty. And unlike many other kinds of experiences, where the first experience is great and the subsequent experiences aren't so hot, beauty rewards us every single time. One of the number one rules of sustainability is that it's always or almost always better to maintain what we have rather than to build something new, regardless of how green it is. So readapting downtown Sacramento in order to make it the great place that it should be, retrofitting leaky old buildings here in downtown Sacramento is always greener than building a lead platinum building out in the middle of nowhere. But we don't maintain places that aren't beautiful. Um, and this is basically just simply how we are hardwired. And so what I urge you also to do, in addition to thinking about how to make sure that your values are reflected in the rules and regulations of your government, is also to make sure that those rules and regulations embrace beauty. Thank you.